Okay, so welcome everybody. Uh, good morning. I uh, please ask you to sit and close the main door at the back of the room. If you can close the main door, it will be better. Thank you very much. Uh, so welcome to the teaching week of uh, for this year. Uh, I know you start yesterday. Unfortunately, I couldn't be here yesterday because I was busy in Bologna with the examination of master students. Please, if you can close the door, close the door. Thank you. OK, so there should be some new students just recruited for the 38 cycle. I want to say that this. Uh, this last. Uh, uh, cycle the 38th one officially start uh, November 1st 2022. Uh, we recruited new students until January, February more or less. So at the end uh, for the 38th cycle uh, we got uh, in uh, uh, 17 new students, which is a lot for our PhD program is the record. And uh, now just Friday, we start working for the next cycle that will start in uh, uh, this year uh, in uh, November uh, 23. But we are already starting all the bureaucratic administrative procedure to start all the things that we need to be prepared for the next examination and the next uh, cohort of students, new students. Uh, I'm Stefano Goffredo. Maybe some of you is the first time you see me. The other, all the older students uh, know me already. I'm uh, the coordinator of the of the program, and uh, the co-coordinator is uh, Mauro Marini. You met uh, him yesterday, and uh, uh, Mauro Marini is the co-coordinator from the National Research Council. In fact, this PhD program is co-founded. Uh, uh, by the University of Bologna and the National Research Council together since the 2018. So we start uh, already some years ago. Uh, just a few words about the teaching week. That's the only mandatory things that you have in your PhD program. Uh, other than the academic board meeting uh, from September to December, more or less every year. You need to be admitted to the next year. OK, so you have to join and present your results at, at the academic board meeting. So that's a mandatory activity that you have to join the month, the academic board meeting, uh, board meeting from September to December. And the other mandatory activity that you have, no matter if you need to go out abroad, you know, since the beginning of the program, is the teaching activity, which is always uh, organized the first week of March in Fano, in this uh, uh, center where the PhD program is officially uh, headquartered. Uh, then another few uh, words for the new students before starting the lesson. Uh, you know that in order to be admitted to the final exam at the third year, you need to reach some goals. The goals are first the publication of at least two papers. In international journal, let's say impact factors, Scopus journal, whatever you want to mention the index <laughs> reference at international journal and in at least one paper, you must be first author. That's the one mandatory required required. The second is the uh, period abroad of at least three months. OK. Uh, the third requirement is the participation to at least one international conference. OK, and then, as I said before, the participation to the teaching activities. OK, so be sure to sign in the register that you were present in this uh, uh, week, for example. Uh, OK, now for today, I'm uh, pleased to uh, and I thank uh, Alessandro Lucchetti. Alessandro is member of our academic board, board, uh, uh, academic board uh, since the beginning of the program. 
is one of the most active uh, uh, teacher and scientist in our PhD program. Is a fishery ecology biologist, okay, uh, expert in fishery biology and uh, to, uh, the fishing technology. And today is having his uh, class for us. So thank you, Alessandro, and welcome. Thank I you. I go there to enjoy your class for the time that is allowed to me until the first phone call. <laughs> thank you. Okay, thank you, Stefano. Can you hear me if I stay like this? Okay. So basically, uh, I'm a fishing technologist, and uh, we are, uh, I would say, a few remain in the Mediterranean. Uh, so I'm specialized on, on fishing technology, honestly. And uh, in the last 15 years, I worked on the bycatch reduction. So uh, I know some of you, uh, and uh, I consider you as my colleagues, then Please consider this as a, a chat with you. And uh, for some of you, I will uh, describe something that is probably not so useful because you know uh, the problem and probably you know the fishing activity, but uh, you have several different skills and, and uh, bits of activities. Then uh, um, I, I will try to merge uh, some different skills. And uh, at the end of this presentation, um, uh, so this presentation, I, I'd like to, to make a kind of path from uh, what are my skills, what are the, the problems that I want to describe, and finally, how this can be arranged in a research project. And um, so we'll see. I, I don't know if uh, I'm able to do this, but we'll see. So uh, today we, we will talk about the the bycatch, how to assess the bycatch, uh, the different types of bycatch by, by species or better group of species, bycatch estimates, how to mitigate the bycatch, and that, that, that's the part about the fishing technology. Uh, so first of all, vulnerable species. What What's a vulnerable species? Uh, today, uh, you will see that there are several different uh, conventions, regulations, etc. Uh, speaking about uh, the theoretically protected species, um, the most important probably is the Con Bar Barcelona Convention, and uh, the most widely accepted classification of vulnerable species and classification of different level of. Um, protection needed by species is the UCN, uh, the red list of the International Union for the Conservation of Nature. And uh, <clears throat> the, the UCN, I don't know if you went in, in their website, but uh, you will find all the, the, all the species in the world that need a kind of protection. And uh, there are several categories that is near threatened, vulnerable, endangered, or critically endangered, according to the different level of protection that, that a species need to, to, to have. But, there is a but. There are, at least, uh, in my opinion, uh, a couple of problems. The first, if you go in the uh, UCR red list, uh, some assessment are more than 10 years old. So you don't know exactly the, the real situation. It's a problem, and we'll see later, uh, because um, dealing with protected species and bycatch, we are speaking about something which is quite, uh, let would say, not common. It remains uh, a quite uncommon uh, type of catch, the catch of a protected species. I mean, let's say a turtle here in, in the Adriatic. Uh, and then you don't have an, an assessment like uh, commercial species. We have experts here of uh, assessment, uh, let's say European hake, red mallet, etc. Um, that's the first problem. <clears throat> uh, the second problem is that when you speak about a protected species, uh, in most of cases, this is just the word. I mean because that species could, would be protected just in theory. 
Because, okay, uh, the species is included in the UCN red list, but if you don't have a formal act from the European Commission, member state, etc., which is a regulation, a law, a, a decree, etc., protecting specifically that species, uh, you just have words. I mean, um, that's a real problem because uh, we don't have so much species that are formally protected, especially when we speak about, uh, I would say, sharks. You have a list. Uh, it's a mess because uh, you have. I tried in the past to make a review of the different regulations uh, protecting sharks, but that's a mess because you have uh, this kind of list of species spread in 10, 15 regulations. So it's really complicated to build the the the, the situation. Um, how the, the, the UCN assess this, there are several different, uh, um, let's say, aspects that the UCN consider, not only the, the assessment, but also uh, the habitat loss uh, or the different types of direct mortality, etc. cetera. Um, well, so what, what is bycatch? Seems to be stupid, I mean, but before reaching this picture, I remember we discussed uh, 15 years to reach this because uh, uh, if you consider the catch, it's. Uh, can you hear me? I have to, to stay here. It's better. Um, if you consider the catch, let's say a bottom trolling, uh, there are different sections of this catch. The target species which is the species that we want to catch. Not so common here in, in the Mediterranean. Uh, we can say, let's say, if you go fishing small pelagic with a fair troll or with a poor seine and circling net, you have a target species or both, two species, anchovy and sardine. If you go, for instance, uh, catching bluefin and tuna with a poor seine, you have a you have a target species, which is a bluefin tuna. Uh, with a long line, if you want to catch a swordfish, your target species is the swordfish. But if you speak about uh, bottom trolling, some of you have experience of that and, and can explain, like me, uh, you don't have just one single target species. Uh, but if you have a, a target species, all the other is a bite, is bycatch. Something that you don't want to catch really. But in the bycatch, you have a portion of the species that are of commercial importance, which is the commercial bycatch. And the other species that do not have any commercial importance, that are discards. But the situation is quite complicated because if you have a target species uh, under size, this is discard. If you have a target species, we see is damage because uh, in the bottom trolling, you know, uh, you have uh, more than 100 kilos of fish, uh, stones, etc. It can be uh, spoiled, damaged, etc. This is discard. So before reaching this situation, oh, there was a long story among scientists because we like uh, speaking about nothing. And uh, another important part of the catch is the debris. Stones, wood, uh, uh, I would say here also plastic, which is a quite uh, famous subject today. And one part of the bycatch is the incidental catch of vulnerable species. So. Vulnerable species is, is a part of bycatch. Uh, usually when I speak with people that do not know the, what happened on the sea bottom, I show this video. I didn't remember the music. Okay. So imagine a, like an helicopter uh, towing a net on land. And imagine this like a bottom trolling. You can catch... Uh, trees, other species, 
and you also catch your target species, the peaks. When you have all this catch, funny music, uh, really. Uh, when you have the catch, you take it, all these on board and you have the sorting. You can take the, the big uh, and commercial species, you discard the small one, and you discard also the species that you don't want to eat. So this is an explanation of, of bycatch. Um, to be practical, this is a, a bottom trolling here in the Adriatic, not so far from here, less than 20 kilometers probably. Um, especially in this period, let's say from uh, November to March, you could have this situation. Your target species is Squilla mantis, the mantis shrimp. But in the same catch, you have, uh, you see, this is probably Umbrina cirrosa, which is obviously a commercial bycatch. And uh, you can see in this hole, this is about one hour of towing. You have a four turtles, which is a protected species bycatch. Um, but you can see also, I did a mention here, you can see litter, which is the most important litter here in the Adriatic from uh, Trieste up to Puglia. Uh, the tar, the nets uh, in the mass of aquaculture. If you speak about long line, you have your target species, which is the, the swordfish, Xithas ladius, but you can have also commercial bycatch, Tunus alalunga or Corifena, Ipurus. And, uh, but again, you can have protected species bycatch, quite common, that one, really common, the blue, the blue shark, Bionace uh, glauca, especially in the drifting on lines, is really common. Or uh, sea turtles, quite common also, the, the bycatch of sea turtles. Uh, <coughs> um, so the commercial fishing is uh, one of the main treats for the conservation of this kind of megafauna. Um, you have different gears. I will have some videos for non-experts because uh, uh, we speak about bottom trolling, but uh, how many of you were on board of bottom trolling? You, you, you. But the majority of you uh, were never on board of, of bottom trolling. Then uh, I think it is useful to see what happened on board. Um, I spent something like 15 or 20 years in training courses for the Coast Guard in Italy, uh, speaking about uh, uh, control, inspections, etc. Uh, I remember that when they went on board, they were experts, excellent experts. After the first toll, they didn't recognize uh, an anchovy from uh, an ache, I would say. And uh, so, if I want to suggest, it is extremely useful to go on board and to see what happened on board in general. I mean, not only for this specific uh, subject. That is because uh, most of you or some of you are working with models, etc. But uh, in my opinion, if you go on board and see what happened, sometimes numbers are quite different from the numbers that you manage in your models. You have to experience, I mean, the, what's the real situation. That's why uh, on, on Tuesday, I suggest to go uh, on deck to see what happened when the, 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 the fishermen come back with the, their boats uh, to see which kind of species are there, the seasonality, uh, the, the undersized species and um, problem, etc. So go on board and see, look, etc. Um, 
so we have different fishing gears that can affect in different way uh, and different group of species. Uh, also the area, the season, the, the, the gear properties especially. Uh, consider the, the mesh size of a, of a net, uh, the, the hook dimension, the hook shape, uh, etc. The towing speed. Towing speed is really important. The, 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 the soaking time. <clears throat> uh, there are different types of gear. Uh, if you consider bottom trolling, catching, let's say, uh, a turtle. If you have if you have a, a tow duration of around uh, two hours or three hours, if you catch a turtle at the beginning, probably the diet of mortality would be really high. But if you reduce the, the soaking time, the tow duration at less than one hour, we experience that the direct mortality, at least the direct mortality, is not so high, less than 10%. So there are several different parameters affecting the, the, the bycatch and also the direct and, and also delayed mortality. Uh, yes, and another, another effect of fishing is that sometimes uh, fishing and vulnerable species or protected species are competing from the same resources. And then uh, uh, when you reduce the, 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 the feeding, prey of a species, you that that's a, a, a parallel and competitive factor. I mean, um, you know, when we speak about uh, uh, protected species or megafauna in general, we are speaking about uh, key strategy species. And so <clears throat> large size of first maturity, high age of First maturity, low growth rate, etc. You know all these problems with sharks, uh, with other species, uh, and uh, <clears throat> but this type of bycatch is a matter of a concern not only for uh, NGOs, let's say uh, WWF, uh, Oceania, and other, but it's a problem. Uh, Yes, for scientists, uh, for fishing industries, I will show you later, but sometimes the interaction between protected species and fishing activities in ne is negative for both of actors. So presently I'm leading a project on dolphin uh, bycatch and let's say dolphin fishery interaction reduction. And the, the interaction between dolphins and fishing activities costs money to fishermen because dolphins destroy the nets or uh, stole the fish, the, the spoil the fish coat or spread the school of fish in an area, especially here in, in the Adriatic. Uh, so there are several different negative effects for both fishing activities and uh, I would say also socioeconomic uh, efforts. I don't know if you see probably yesterday or before yesterday, uh, that these negative interactions often lead to um, retaliation activity from fishermen. Not so common, but uh, just yesterday or before yesterday, I saw a picture coming from here, Rimini, uh, with a, a turtle recovered by uh, rescue centers here uh, in Catolica with a clear sign of knife uh, on the carapace of a turtle. This is what I mean when with the uh, retaliation activity. We we we, we found also uh, dolphins or uh, turtles uh, hit by uh, probably fishermen, obviously. And uh, okay, then it's a kind of a really complicated. Uh, um, two problems. <clears throat> What we see uh, when, we, when we go on board uh, is the direct mortality. That is, you recover your, your gear, net, uh, long line, poor scene, etc. You find a turtle, a shark, or, or whatever. It's alive, 
okay, is that it's a diet of mortality. But uh, if the specimen is uh, still alive when you recover the net and you uh, you deliver again this uh, specimen at sea, you don't know what happened. Um, I mean, if a turtle stay on and bottom trolling for uh, one hour or two hours, obviously, when you retrieve on board, probably they move, but you don't know exactly the, the status. I mean, uh, uh, we published a paper uh, a couple of years ago with the veterinarians from the University of Bari. The, um, something like more than 70 or 80 percent of turtles caught that seems to be alive and in a good shape. Uh, instead, they, they were in a gas embolism situation. Then uh, if a fisherman take the turtle and free the turtle directly, you don't know what happened, but probably this turtle uh, will experience uh, delayed mortality in a few hours, a few days, etc. And then uh, you, you will find stranded uh, after a month or according to the currents, I mean. Um, but <laughs> we have a big problem. That is the, the, the gaps in knowledge. Uh, there is a a document published by the GFCM, General Fishery Commission for the Mediterranean, last year, uh, highlighting all these problems. I mean, uh, we don't have so much data on quantitative and qualitative data on bycatch. That is mainly because uh, an, an ad hoc prog program of monitoring started just uh, a few years ago. Another problem is that uh, we don't have, at least here in this basin, in the Mediterranean, I'm speaking, the same level of monitoring everywhere. Uh, we have deep monitoring, especially in the EU countries, but you don't know what happened in the other countries, let's say in the North Africa countries. They are trying to standardize procedures but there is not a standardization in the Mediterranean, at least uh, until now. And these different level of monitoring can create bias, obviously, because you can have a false positive or false negative uh, of the problem. Uh, another problem is that uh, I would say I'm working with uh, NGOs, uh, working with the protected species since uh, 10 or 15 years. And in my opinion, one of the main problem is uh, the business. I mean, all these NGOs to survive have to, to make business. And to make business, they have to carry out several activities. So one of these is monitoring. We have uh, in Italy something like 100 different uh, small associations, NGOs, etc., making their own small monitoring with local interest. And then, theoretically, we have a lot of data. But putting it all, today, all together and to build one single database, uh, collecting the data from the different uh, agencies, etc., is uh, really complicated. I bet that some of you working with models uh, have the same uh, story with fishery data, probably. Here, the situation is, is even more uh, complicated. Uh, and uh, so standards, etc. Um, and all these, if you don't have a clear situation, you cannot have a clear management because uh, to have uh, and to set management measures, you have to have uh, a clear situation. Otherwise, the managers do not accept this and to set the new rules. Uh, so this is a bottom trolley. Uh, just to give you an idea, uh, obviously we have a small vessels from uh, let's say 12, 50 meters of length up to vessels that has more than 40 meters. 
But, but just to give you an idea, all the nerves from the wings that are this part here, up to the codend, which is the last part, we are speaking about uh, 40 up to 70, 80 meters. Uh, there are two big uh, control, door, control doors to spread the horizontal opening of the vessel of the net, and this type of net has a huge impact on the bottom. And, uh, and you can imagine that from the horizontal opening, I mean, uh, from this side to the other wings, uh, we are speaking about uh, 15 up to 30 meters. Just to give you an idea, and uh, this type of vessel usually tow between uh, 2.5 up to 4.5 uh, miles, and then you can imagine the, the area swept by this gear in an hour, just to give you an idea. Um, I leave the audio because I'm not sure about what they say, but just to Give an idea, this is what happened on board with the codern. When we speak about the multi-specificity of Mediterranean, biodiversity, etc., you will see it there. In each hole, you will have uh, something like 30 or 40 different species. And uh, just uh, 10, 15 of them have a commercial interest. And this is what remain at the end of the sorting, which is this car. The are species without commercial importance, uh, undersize, damage, etc. And all these come back to the sea. Death, obviously. And this is a matter for scavenger. Let's say seabirds or uh, bottom scavengers. Yes, if something is alive, uh, we, we hit for the final uh, destination. And, uh, and uh, also, if you see, if you see what happened in the code at the end of the hole, you can see that most of fish is still alive and can swim. Therefore, if you manage to modify the, the, the technical properties of a net, let's say, let's say mesh opening, you can give fish or uh, protected species, etc., a possibility to escape and to survive. That's why technical properties of fishing gears is so important. I mean, even if uh, the other side uh, of the story is that, yes, you can see. Are you able to recognize some species? You know that species? I'm not asking for your uh, expert, but for the other. I would say that the other part of the story is that uh, we spent something like uh, 30 years to change the mesh opening of a codon of just uh, one centimeter, just to give you an idea how difficult it is to modify the technical properties of fishing gears. The problem, in, which is frustrating, I mean, also for scientists, is that changing rules in the Mediterranean and especially in Italy is uh, a long path. It is not so easy and it is frustrating. If you find uh, that an area should be closed because it's plenty of juveniles or is uh, reproduction, uh, a breeding area for some species. Uh, you can stress this with managers, but changing this in a, into a regulation and translating this in, into a regulation is a, a different story. Uh, this is a rapido trolling. It is used also for uh, some uh, thesis here, probably the Solomon survey use this exactly this gear which is uh, 
I would say a cage with the teeth in the in the in the lower part. The, the strange is that this gear is only allowed in Italy here in the Adriatic. The target species is the common sore. But everywhere in the world, this gear is a dredge. It's not the bottom trolling like in Italy. Uh, also, uh, it is difficult to change this uh, because everywhere, in, if you if you go in North Europe, this is a dredge because you are catching on the bottom uh, with a heavy gear like like this with. Uh, let's say up from three up to four meters with and uh, they tow at the at the speed of seven, eight knots, which is quite uh, 20 kilometers per hour. They tow four of, of these here, then you can make four, you have 16 meters, up to seven, eight knots for uh, all the day, because they, this type of catch is really stressful also, I would say, but it's a continual activity. And uh, yes, the problem is that uh, just to see what happened, this is the, the common speed that they have. Really fast. That from from this the name rapido trolling. They have a huge impact on on the bottom. You can imagine this gear. Really heavy, with the teeth on the lower part. I don't know if I have uh, put here some. Yes. This is what happened. Underwater, we put a camera there, and you can see when they touch the bottom, the teeth, you cannot see anything for an hour because the impact is, is really high. And you can see when they hold the net, the gear, the speed on the bottom and the type of impact that this gear can have. Uh, obviously, uh, the selectivity of this gear is practically zero because uh, because of the small mesh they use and because uh, the types of catch is really dirty. Plenty of debris, let's see. Uh, so I did this uh, something like 10 years ago with the side scan sonar, just to check what happened on the bottom with the different types of gear. Uh, that's a bottom trolley that we see before. And that's a uh, rapid trolling for for rapid trolling. One of each is four meter, and you can see the sediment and the huge impact they have on the bottom. Uh, another gear which is really typical in the, the Adriatic is the pair trolling. So in Italy we have almost just this, two vessels, one net, but in other part of the Mediterranean, such as in France, they have one one net, one uh, one vessel. Uh, really, really large nets, more than 100 meters in length, and uh, they use a eco sounder to identify the, the the school of fish, and you can see that. It's a quite selective fishing gear because your target species is the most part of the catch. And uh, so consider that in just one hour they can catch uh, tons of fish. If you are able to identify the school of fish. Uh, You can catch uh, sometimes. My record was, uh, if I remember well, 10 of these catch in an hour. Obviously, they cannot uh, recover all this catch in one single tool, and then they divide the catch uh, step by step. 
Now, uh, the procedural board is a bit different because they they put all the cash directly in a tank with water and ice. Uh, but that's just to provide uh, an insight of what happened. The poor thing. Uh, so basically, we have two types of the of gears in, in, in the Mediterranean. The one is this one for large pelagic species, and the other one is the Lampara. Uh, but the Lampara for the small pelagic, I would say anchovy and sardine. And uh, <clears throat> but the procedure is almost the same. What is different is how they gather the fish. In case of bluefin tuna, they use simply sightings on board. For a small pelagic, they use lamp to attract the school and then to, to hold the net. Um, and this type of gear is actually used uh, to catch uh, probably 80% of the bluefin tuna in the Mediterranean. And when they catch, they put all the school of all, all the, the fish in these cages, and step by step, they are to probably, uh, I don't know the last uh, percentage, but I, I would bet that more than 70% of bluefin tuna now are in Malta, in the farm, uh, in the farms in, in Malta. And uh, so just to give you an idea, actually, every single specimen of bluefin tuna should be recorded. Uh, it's probably one of the most controlled fishing activity in the Mediterranean. And uh, this is what happened from the net, from the poor seine to the cage. They open a kind of, uh, with uh, scuba divers, they open a, a kind of window. And then, step by step, all the fish move into the cage. This is one single toe. This is one of the few uh, fishery in the Mediterranean managed by quota. That's why you have to monitor every single uh, bluefin tuna. And uh, so if you see the, the size of this catch, uh, yes, the, now there are under, uh, underwater cameras that are more or less uh, likely to, to measure the fish. And, uh, but you can imagine that if a vessel have, has a quota, sometimes in a few days the quota is reached and then they have to stop fishing. And if you see, this is uh, just a single shot of net. I mean, uh, they put the net, they see the, the school of fish, shoot the net, encircle the, the school, and recover the net, like this. And you can see that in this case, they caught something like, I don't remember if 2,000 or more uh, bluefin tuna. that are still alive and that are transferred to Malta to, to be fed. Uh, and, uh, you know, the, the story, most of the, pro most of the product uh, reached the Japan. And, uh, and this was uh, uh, I don't remember. I took that, that picture probably South Campania or uh, Calabria. Uh, that's another uh, story of the problem. Uh, when you farm a fish, you, you have to, to feed this fish, and uh, to feed the, the fish, you have to catch other fish, uh, and uh, you know the story. You have to catch uh, a small pelagic to feed a large pelagic. Uh, you know the conversion factor, which is less than uh, one, uh, ten, the, the 10%, and then, uh, so the risk is to overexploit in other stock of fish instead of the, the biggest one. Uh, 
that about the people do it. Uh, I don't know. Probably yes, because they monitor every single uh, transfer from the from the the, the tuna from the from the net to the cage. I suppose really low, but uh, I know for sure that uh, some uh, some specimen die and, and even uh, uh, we die percentage during the transferring because they have to tow at less than two knots. And you can imagine if you catch uh, tuna, in, let's say in the Tyrrhenian Sea, and you have to transfer to Malta and to feed during the, the travel, the, the fish is uh, a quite complicated story. This is what happened with Lampara, quite old uh, fishing activity. They use small vessels, something like two, three small vessels with lamps uh, attracting the school of fish. Then they convert in a single point. And all the school is uh, under one single vessel with uh, the lamp light on. And then the, the, the matter, the, the, the biggest vessel uh, encircled all the school. Uh, So we'll see the problem of with uh, vulnerable species with this type of activity is mostly in the West Mediterranean, Morocco, Spain, and uh, they have problem with the uh, dolphins because they hit the net. And uh, in the last few years, they have problem with the killer whales entering from the Atlantic Ocean and uh, in the West Mediterranean, they have problem with killer whales. You see, the catch is uh, almost 100% uh, of small pelagic, and usually uh, the fish quality. So we saw in, from this presentation two different uh, uh, fishing techniques to, to, to catch small pelagic. The first one was the fake trolling, and the second is the, the poor seine with lamps. Obviously, the, the quality of catch is much better with this uh, with these fishing techniques because in the other uh, you 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 have a tow the fish is inside the cordon uh, for an hour uh, but in this case the the fish is completely alive. Uh, otherwise, uh, With the uh, with the poor seine or poor seine without poor line, but it's uh, too technical for now. I don't want to spend time uh, because there are several different technical parameters of fishing gears affecting the catch, affecting the bycatch. Uh, probably you know the problem uh, from the the. the... We, we passed, I guess, the one of the picture company. Yeah, yeah. I, I took this this picture from Malta. Ah, okay, but yeah, yeah, yeah. They seen them. They they use bricks from uh, buildings, etc. And uh, yes, that one. Uh, you have a kind of float with uh, palm leaves that attract some different uh, species, especially Corifena purus. And uh, when the school of fish is below the, 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 the shadow, they encircle this area and they catch the... But again, uh, <clears throat> we have problem of bycatch also with this fishery. And uh, it is not easy to collect data on these fisheries, but uh, I would say this situation is not so far from the, from the real one. I try to collect several data all around the Mediterranean, and more or less, there are uh, in the Mediterranean several hundred vessels doing this, and uh, each vessel uses something like 20 up to 100 uh, fats. The problem is also that at the end of the season, uh, they simply cut the row and uh, leaving the, the stones on the bottom. And uh, I remember in Malta, here uh, we were on board the bottom trolling. Uh, we caught something like this uh, every hole. 
So every single hole you catch uh, a stone like this because it's plant, especially in Malta, is plenty of buds. They have a special uh, EU regulation regulating the use of fats in Malta. Uh, they have all the area around Malta is allocated uh, for uh, uh, different sectors by fishermen uh, using fats. In Italy, no, no. It's legal, but you have to follow some rules uh, for uh, the signals. Uh, you have to report the the tags with uh, the number of, of the the registration number of the vessel, etc. But uh, the, the the real situation is that the in Italy the signal is like this with bottles, uh, plastic bottles, etc. But it's the same also for this because it, uh, for this gear, uh, if you go everywhere on the on on the harbor here in Fano, and you ask fishermen, you know that you have to to signal your gear with a tag, uh, metal tag, reporting the registration number of your vessel. No one knows this regulation. Uh, these are set nets. Quite famous in the Mediterranean. Kill net is one single <coughs> net panel. Consider that for this type of gears, the regulation says that uh, one single boat can talk, can, can use from uh, 4,000 meters up to 6,000 meters of net. According to the fish to the fishers on board. Uh, for the trammel, then you have three panels, uh, two lateral with uh, two lateral panels with la large meshes and the internal panel with uh, small meshes, and they combine at net that are the, the standard configuration is to have. Uh, a trammel net on the bottom and uh, a gill net in the upper part is to catch different species. Gill net uh, here is used mostly to catch uh, common sole. Uh, during winter, they catch also uh, turbot with large meshes. Uh, trammel net is used for everything. I mean, the Mediterranean Sea they use for uh, um, red mallets. Uh, in the Adriatic is commonly used from now on, from March up to June for uh, cuttlefish. Combined net used for everything to catch bottle and uh, pelagic species. This type of net can have uh, a drop height up to 50 meters or something like that. And, uh, but this is, this is the standard situation. If you go in Turkey, they have uh, up to eight different uh, panels with tram and net, uh, gear net, tram and net, gear net. It's really complicated. This is what happened simply. They recovered the net like this. And uh, I had several videos, but I don't know where. But you can imagine uh, like a wall of net on the bottom and uh, they catch uh, in a passive way because th this is uh, a passive or static gear waiting for the movement of fish uh, toward the towards the net. Uh, this is uh, a quite uncommon uh, gear, which is always a gill net, one single uh, netting panel, but but that's a drift net. The difference is that in this case, the gear is, is fixed on the bottom by means of uh, anchors and signal on, with the uh, floats. And uh, in this case, the gear is left free to the current, and uh, it's a, a quite uh, questionable uh, fishing gear, I mean, because uh, if you use large meshes, more than 
10 centimeters. You enter the words of uh, Spadara net, which are uh, illegal drift nets, still used, uh, but illegal since uh, 1992. 1992, probably, yes. Um, but in some area of the south of Italy, and uh, I found some types of net uh, like this uh, also in uh, Slovenia and uh, near uh, Trieste. They also use drifting nets for uh, anchovies, sardines, and small pelagic. It's a really highly selective fishing gear because you can see there they only catch uh, small pelagic with uh, really high market price. We have some in the south of Italy, some uh, residuum of slow food. Don't know the name, but anchovy like this reach uh, a market value of more than 20 euros per kilo, which is really high. <coughs> okay, and these are the target species, but uh, the different target species. We are speaking about uh, Sicily, Campania, Calabria, and yes, that's all, more or less. But, uh, but the problem is that if you use large meshes, like in the past with the Spadara, uh, the problem shift to the bycatch, dolphins, turtles, etc. But they are still using everywhere in the Tyrrhenian Sea in an uh, illegal way, Spadara nets. Uh, even last year, I was uh, involved as a technical expert in uh, in a dispute between uh, Coast Guard and fishermen uh, in uh, Liguria. So it is not a simple a problem of Sicily or uh, Calabria. And they were using an illegal spadaran. So this is a, a long line. You have a main line up to 60 kilometers. Use on the surface with a thousand of hooks with a bait. And on the surface, they are commonly used to, to are commonly used to catch swordfish, uh, uh, albacore. This is the type of bait. This video was made by Andrea Petetta, your colleague. Of, uh, and they use also artificial bait. That's the new frontiers because if you use frozen squid, it costs money, then they shift to the the artificial bait and uh, if you see in this case they catch uh, tuna small one really small one almost uh, near the the minimum conservation reference size but they also catch uh, I don't see if another Yes, that's a small Swordfish, not so small because sometimes they 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 catch a really small one for that species. The, for swordfish, there is a, a closed season for fishing, mainly due to the presence of uh, they call uh, pulcinella in Italy, in the south of Italy, the small uh, swordfish. 
<clears throat> but you can see that also the bycatch. Quite common in one single day. Probably the, this is the most common type of bycatch for this gear, with, which is the uh, the blue shark, Pionace glauca. Really common in, in drifting long line. Then we have at the bottom long line, which is the same gear, but used on the bottom to catch uh, white fish. Practically the same, but used, but used on the bottom. But also in this case, uh, uh, we can have problems with uh, bycatch, especially in, in the central Mediterranean, Tunisia, uh, Algeria, and uh, yes. The problem of all this, I mean, uh, impact on top of predators such as uh, sharks, etc. You know, uh, in ecology is the fishing down the marine food web. Um, I don't want to spend time on this because probably some of you know the matter better than me, but uh, the real situation when you have a fishing down the food web is simply, you can see this simply going on, on the arbor, waiting for the fishermen and look at the catch. Uh, I remember 15 years ago uh, with rapid trolling, the catch was almost uh, completely, 100% of the catch was uh, only common salt or uh, some uh, shrimp or uh, squilla mantis. In the last, let's say, 10 years, you see that uh, half catch or even more than half catch half catch and uh, something like half, half of revenues is about uh, Bolinus brandaris, which is a scavenger species, which is a sign of the fishing down the marine food web. You don't have so much to catch uh, and remain, and then we have to, to put on the market other species. If you see in the last few years, on board the fishing vessels, you, you, you see landed also crabs. In the past, this never happened in the past. It's a sign of fishing down the marine food web, and it's a sign of really highly exploited areas because you, you put on the market uh, scavengers such as the bolinus or uh, species that in the past I have considered the uh, poor species. Let's make a break. OK.
Okay. Um, so for protected species bycatch, the problem is the, the, the data collection. I mean, we need data to, to find out information to be submitted for managers and to provide advice uh, uh, for managers, I mean. <clears throat> uh, the most important data are the obviously the quantity, the size, the species distribution, and um, to have information is a key factor to have uh, uh, to, to know the, the the nature and the extent of the problem, but mostly to identify hotspot areas of interactions between fishing activities and protected species. The problem is that. Uh, different gears have a different impact on different species and in different areas and seasons. So the problem is quite complicated. <clears throat> uh, collecting data is important to identify which is the gear most, uh, let's say, problematic. And uh, according to this, identify what are the best technical solution to, to reduce the bycatch and we'll see later. So all these knowledge uh, obviously are essential to identify management measures. Which kind of data? The same story uh, of all the types of data on fishing activities, the fishery dependent and the fishery independent data. The first one are obtained directly from commercial fisheries and the other for uh, let's say surveys, monitoring program, etc. <clears throat> uh, for fishery data, the most effective solution is to have onboard observers. Obviously, with observers, you will have uh, much, deta much detailed data uh, on dimension of each species, uh, sex, uh, etc. The other types of information from fishery dependent data are the self-reporting or logbooks. And we'll see later, uh, each of these has positive and uh, negative aspects, I mean. Uh, the other types are interviews, uh, surveys with fishermen, uh, what is actually known as local ecological knowledge, which is quite uh, common right now, especially to assess these type of problems, which are not so common. And uh, it's a problem that you cannot tackle just with uh, onboard observers because bycatch is still remain quite uh, uncommon, let's say. And uh, this will require a huge effort with onboard observers, with high cost, etc. Uh, the other frontiers is the remote electronic monitoring. Um, <clears throat> not so common, not so easy, and uh, not applied yet in the Mediterranean. This implies the use of uh, onboard cameras and uh, artificial intelligence to the automatic recognition of the species code. We are applying for a, for a EU proposal right now. And um, the problem is that you can use, at least in the Mediterranean, this technology, at least in my opinion, for that type of fishing activities where uh, you can detect easily each single specimen. I mean, therefore, passive nets and long lining. Because uh, if you can imagine to put a camera on board, how are a bottom trawler, where you have all the catch stored on deck and uh, the sorting 
happens directly on deck with uh, all the catch stored, uh, it's it's a mess. It's not feasible to recognize the single species from uh, 100 or 200 of kilos of catch. Uh, in the North Sea, uh, or uh, especially in the United States, this technology is quite advanced, but they have a completely different uh, procedure of the catch on board compared to the Mediterranean situation, so it's much easier. Uh, the fishery independent data, it's what we call surveys, especially, and uh, here the, the historical uh, survey that we have in the Mediterranean is the Mediz, uh, leaded for uh, the Adriatic uh, by this institute, Pano Institute since uh, back more than 30 years. And uh, that's, that's an effective way to collect data because you are able to collect several different information. Most of some of you uh, are experts of this type of surveys with Solomon, where you are able to collect all the specimen, to measure all of them, to, to make the so to check the, the sex, uh, the sexual maturity, etc. Uh, so you are able to collect so much more detailed data than uh, with a single or two observers on board a vessel. On the other end, you don't have directly data on commercial fishery. Another type of types of data is quite common used for uh, bycatch species. And it's uh, collecting data from strandings and from rescue centers. Let's say rescue sea turtle rescue centers. You have the, an idea of how many turtles are collected, even with uh, a certain type of bias. I mean, uh, especially because strandings, you don't know exactly from where these specimen stranded comes due to the currents, uh, etc. Then uh, each of, of this uh, data collection has positive and negative aspects. Uh, you can see from this table, ob obviously, the main uh, trouble with the observer on boards are the costs, because are usually quite high. Sometimes you don't have space on board. Consider very small uh, fishing vessels. You cannot go on board directly to and you have to wait the fishermen on, on our board. Um, but with uh, an observer on board, you have a really accurate and reliable data of what happened on board the fishing, ve uh, fishing vest, yes. And um, for the self-reporting or logbooks, the, the main problem is the under-reporting from fishermen. I mean, especially when you speak about uh, bycatch species, uh, there is a huge constraint from fishermen to really declare what they catch. I mean, uh, for trouble with the day fear, there are trouble with uh, coast guard inspections, etc. So sometimes uh, what they report is uh, underestimated from the real situation. Um, <clears throat> yes, okay. In general, a combination of all these uh, approach will provide a better picture of the situation because uh, collecting data from fishery costs money. Uh, it's an expense so not only for money, but also resources in terms of personnel on board. And, uh, you know, the suggestion is to use a, a comprehensive approach with both fishery and dependent and independent. Um, what's the deadline for this lesson? Just to have an idea. One o'clock. Half. Uh, okay. Um, yes, observers on board are are the perfect way to to collect data, but it's unfeasible to to reach the at least the the level of detail that that allow you to have a picture of the situation. I mean. Uh, if you see the, the 
the, the suggestions that you find in the recent publication from the, the GFCM, they suggest uh, uh, to monitor, I don't remember if the, the quota is 7% of the total fishing effort. And you can imagine that is un absolutely unfeasible. And uh, a compromise it seems to be like 0.5% uh, now. But from the observer, uh, the data are really precise because you know exactly the interaction with fishing gears, the, the number, weight, and the biological information, where exactly the bycatch occurred, and uh, which type of gear, exactly the, 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 which are the, the, the technical properties of this gear. So, and also finally, the, the environmental parameters in that precise moment. Interviews uh, are quite common, especially when you have a lack of data, and especially for bycatch. We use this approach and we publish some papers on this because, uh, you know, collecting data from uh, what is called now local ecological uh, knowledge is uh, an easy way to collect uh, a huge amount of data. Uh, you can get, uh, especially if you have uh, some uh, friends fishermen or uh, fishermen uh, uh, you are used to work with, uh, you can get uh, reliable information on the quality, quality and quantitative uh, type of bycatch, seasonality, geographical, etc. The problem is that the misreporting from fishermen and uh, Mm, you have to follow some uh, uh, very specific techniques for doing these types of uh, surveys because uh, s someone uh, suggests uh, to make uh, telephone surveys because you save time, uh, money, etc. But to be honest, to get reliable data from fishermen, you have to, to make face-to-face -face interviews. To know the fishermen, etc. Yeah, uh, good question. Uh. I don't know why. Suggestion. Sorry, there is a way to. Oh, OK, um, the same for self reporting. You have to trust on reliable fishermen. In this case, you have good data, etc. Sometimes we have to pay the fishermen. Uh, almost uh, always you have to pay. <clears throat> but uh, again, uh, you have to work with uh, Trustable fishermen, I mean. Straining data, you see that the, 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 the type of data you rely on reduce when you use strandings data because you can have qualitative, seasonal, but you, do, you don't know exactly which type of gear uh, unless you have, uh, let's say, uh, an entangled specimen we, or you have a, a dolphin with uh, piece of nets in the mouth uh, or uh, completely entangled specimen, retrieved or stranded, etc. Um, with the remote monitoring, again, you can have a, a good picture of the situation, but uh, again, it is not so easy and uh, it, this implies uh, a good uh, technological development artificial intelligence for automatic recognition of the species. Otherwise, OK, you use a camera on board, but then you have to spend months to, to see what happened and you don't have uh, perfectly the, the, the real situation. You don't have uh, the size of fish or bycatch species. You don't have the sex. You, so you have a, a quite uh, rough information on this. But I believe this can work with uh, 
megafauna. I mean, if you catch a turtle, if you catch a dolphin, this will help to have a, a better picture. And this uh, strongly suggested by the, the European uh, Commission to develop this type of technologies. So for the service, you know, I spoke about before, you have uh, a lot of data dealing with biological, uh, environmental, uh, species distribution mainly. But again, uh, usually you have, you have a survey just for uh, one season because commonly surveys are carried out just once a year and you can lose some seasonality. Uh, in recent years, uh, especially for megafauna, uh, there are some uh, aerial surveys all around the Mediterranean, especially in the EU countries. But again, this is quite uh, expensive because uh, to fly uh, costs something like, for each survey costs something like uh, 100,000 euros. Uh, so really expensive. And uh, yes, you have a, a general view of the situation from the aerial survey. You can see dolphins, uh, turtles, uh, sharks, uh, but again, uh, you can lose, let's say, specimen uh, when they swim uh, at 10 meters of depth. You cannot see them. Uh, you lose the seasonality. So also in this case, there are pro and con uh, negative consequences. And uh, a way, one of the way that are used right now to assess if there are hotspot areas, etc., is the risk assessment. You have to cross the data from uh, fishery, fishing effort. We have experts here with AIS and VMS. You have to cross this type of data with the species distribution. That was just, for example, an example to use uh, uh, tracking data from satellite of a few specimen and crossing them for a, for a year with uh, data from IES. This will help to identify at least uh, that area, areas that could be problematic for a specific year. But if you have the species distribution with data collecting from, uh, let's say, surveys or uh, all the other techniques that I showed you before, if you had the species distribution <coughs> and uh, the data on fishing effort, you can cross these two, two type of data and simply with the GIS, you can have a, a picture of what is the hotspot season and area and gear for that species? This is quite a common approach, a common approach right now. Uh, that is used uh, in several areas, but this implies having good data on, especially on the species distribution. And uh, this is an, another example, but <clears throat> this implies to have good data on fishing effort, and you can have a good picture right now with the IAS or uh, VMS data. But if you if you think, for example, on the small scale fisheries, they are not obliged to have on board this automatic uh, system for the for recording the, the position of the vessel. Uh, then. Uh, there are different approach. Again, uh, you can ask fishermen. Uh, there are now there are way to there are ways to to, to build uh, a fishing effort uh, by small scale fisheries. But obviously, this is not a perfect situation. I mean, uh, using automatic uh, information from uh, AIS and W and uh, VMS uh, is much. It's much better now. There are projects working with uh, low-cost low technologies such as GPS. Uh, uh, in the past uh, ten years, I'm working with uh, hydraulic dredgings, and uh, they are obliged to have on board the GPS. And uh, so you, we know exactly every single uh, movement. 
of that vessel. Then there are a uh, way also to uh, discriminate from fishing activities and uh, from searching for fish, traveling to the from the harbor to the fishing ground, etc. Uh, obviously, mm, at least for the hydraulic dredging, the problem is to have access to this data and to use this data for uh, research and uh, for management purpose, because obviously fishermen, first of all, don't want to show where they fish. And secondly, there is a problem of illegal fisher, fishing, especially for hydraulic dredging, because uh, something like 40 or 50 percent of fishing effort is uh, exerted in illegal fishing areas. I mean, within 0 0.5 from the mine, from mines from the coast. <clears throat> uh, Okay, that's a simple way to report how to cross these two type of data. You need uh, data on number of vessels by, by fleet segment, so what is called the métier. The fishing effort for these uh, for vessels and, and the fleet segment, and the catch per unit effort, also in this case, the, it's the same approach that we use for uh, stock assessment, uh, et cetera. You have, the, uh, you have to provide by catch, um, catch per, by catch per unit effort also for, for the by catch. And with uh, simple translations, I mean, with simple formula, you can have an estimate of the, of the by catch. But the, the most important, I don't want to lose time on this because it's quite easy. You have the, the catch here, vessel, the number of vessel, and uh, what is important is the catch rates in, in specific area and specific gear. That is quite not so easy to, to gather from, uh, from vulnerable species, I mean. This is quite complicated for commercial species to have a, a reliable catch rate, but this is especially complicated for a vulnerable or bycatch species because it, this implies to have a huge onboard effort, huge uh, monitoring effort, etc. So dealing with a single uh, group of species, uh, so, so starting from marine mammals, there are uh, negative consequences for both actors of this uh, interaction, I mean. Uh, the problem, uh, from fishery to marine mammals is, first of all, the entanglement. The marine mammal can be entangled in a, in a fishing net, or the, the marine mammal can injury from the contact with the, the fishing vessel, from a fishing net. Uh, the fishing vessel can reduce also the, the prey for a, for a, dolphin community that's why they the dolphins and fishery compete for the same resources because uh, let's say they eat or they prey on the same species uh, another problem is the ingestion or piece of net especially from uh, dolphins they they are so clever that now they move, they completely change their, be their behavior, especially here in the Adriatic, and they are able to recognize the different types of fishing vessels. They follow bottom trolling and pelagic trolling because they know that they can get so much prey from these type of types of vessels than compared to other fishing vessels or other vessels. In, I'm leading a project which is a live project uh, on this issue, and we have also a section on uh, evaluation of stranding animals with the University of Padua, which is the national responsible for this. Uh, and uh, we found really 
several specimen with a piece of net in, in the esophagus or in the stomach. And obviously, in the long term, the, this, this leads to the, 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 to the death of this specimen in mostly, <laughs> likely 100% of cases. On the other side, uh, mammals are a socioeconomic problem because they steal fish from the net or they can damage or spoil fish. They can damage the gears. And, uh, and also the presence of a, a dolphin in an area can spread the school of fish. Imagine small pelagic. We have experience that uh, if you go on board the pelagic trolling, probably more than 80% of days of fishing, you have uh, an interaction with dolphins in, uh, in the Mediterranean. Uh, so that's a huge problem because they, they can also spread the school of fish and the fisherman is less efficient in catching. <clears throat> uh, these are almost all the, the species concerned in a, Interactions with fishing activity in the Mediterranean, especially Tursium struncatus, which is a, a coastal species. To less extent, the Stenella and the other are quite uh, quite rare. Moxil, uh, common dolphins, which is absolutely not common right now. And the killer whales. But the main problem in the Mediterranean Black Sea is the harbor pulpos in the Black Sea. It's an endemic species. And uh, I have some estimates, but uh, in the last presentation back uh, last month, uh, the, the colleagues from uh, the Black Sea reported something like 16 or 17,000 specimen caught each year. So that's uh, really uh, an incredible problem there. Uh, most of the interactions with uh, marine mammals uh, deals with passive nets because simply they found uh, an easy prey already caught and uh, they come to the nets and simply took the fish from the, the from the net, but sometimes they can get entangled or they can ingest a piece of net. In both cases, they can be injured or, or caught. Uh, some problems uh, are co comes from the, the rope that fishermen use to, to signal the, the fishing gears. Or as you can see from this picture, from the especially from the ingestion, or for the entanglement, as uh, in this case, this is Adriatic Sea. So we are not speaking from uh, from areas from far away, but this is Adriatic. Uh, <clears throat> obviously, they can injure in different part of their bodies, especially from the from the pectoral fins or uh, tail, uh, etc. This is an example of last year in the, probably you know better than me this case, but it's about the illegal drift net used in the south of Italy, South Tyrrhenian Sea. Two sperm whales caught last year, in 2020, if I remember well. And uh, obviously, when you have uh, so large animals, it's not so easy also to free them if you if you see they are by caught in a net like this, uh, because uh, it's uh, dangerous also for the operators. I mean, and then you have to to use uh, some techniques for for uh, for this. And you can see how they are caught and how they are. I I took this picture like a few years ago, probably in Messina or around there. Uh, I was working with the Coast Guard, and 
this is just a single net taken from taken from a, a fisherman that was about uh, 20 kilometers for uh, from 20 to up to 40 meters of net drop then uh, you can imagine it's a really a wall in the water with marine mammals we have also problem with bottom uh, twin trolling and pelagic trolling because usually dolphins follow these so dolphins are right now like scavenger from the tea scars coming from especially from this type of fishing gears. Uh, I took this in the Tyrrhenian Sea in Livorno probably. And uh, you see they practically eat exactly over the, the codon. They can damage the fish. They are quite selective. Um, this is pelagic trolling. Sometimes it happens that they are by coat. That's why here in the Adriatic, the, the onboard monitoring of, with observers uh, for this type of gear for the pelagic trolling is mandatory from a negotiation. <coughs> happens, not, not really common, but it happens. Uh, But again, the problem uh, with this type of gear is the monitoring on board with observer. Let's say last year we were we went on board and uh, we observed two specimens uh, by caught uh, by a single vessel in uh, let's say we did uh, ten. Uh, days on board uh, and uh, in two days we caught uh, dolphins but again if you <coughs> extend this data to dolphins caught in in 10 days to the to the whole fleet and to the whole uh, basin uh, probably you don't have a, a good picture of the situation you probably emphasize too much this problem because probably we were like like Lucky, not lucky, but to observe this type of bycatch, but it it is not so common. From this video, you can see also that dolphins are quite selective and they eat directly on the codon. I have other videos, but I don't remember if I put here because uh, so to be honest, my lessons, my lessons. My lesson at the, at the beginning should be on uh, me on Monday, and uh, I cannot manage to, to 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 revise all this. But yes, we did uh, this video last year, and you can see they are quite selective. In other videos that I have from uh, Turkish colleague, you can see dolphins destroying the, the bottom trolling. But sometimes the relation This is a camera uh, mounted on an, on the on the net mount of a bottom trolling and you can see that the dolphin seems to play with the with the net and obviously to be by coat or to be injured, it's not so uncommon. I mean. The same, uh, these are pictures from uh, poor Seine, light poor Seine. And you can see the, 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 the dolphins are waiting for a fish escaping from the net. Or like this, I don't remember where, where I took this video, but Also here you can see dolphins uh, within the net. So in the past, in the past, I would say in the past, but uh, especially for Pulsini targeting tunas, especially yellowfin tuna, 
the fishermen were used to observe uh, the presence of the dolphins, because if you see dolphins jumping, uh, moving or swimming in a specific area, probably below the dolphins, there are do tunas that, that are catching small pelagic. Then the fishermen were used to encircle the dolphins because they were sure to, to catch also small pelagic fish, obviously. This is illegal, but you know, uh, when you have a big vessel working in the Pacific Ocean or in Indian Ocean, how you can control this? That's why now we have several dolphin safe labels, but again, who knows what happened uh, 200 miles from the coast if the fishing vessel is working without affecting dolphins or without uh, encircling dolphins. That's why in these cases, probably the use of remote electronic monitoring can be an option to, to verify the compliance of these fisheries. Uh, Yes, the same, but we spoke about this. <clears throat> the other problem is about sea turtles. The problem would be entanglement, injuries, ingestion of hook, especially in this case. Long line, especially drifting long line, is not a, a huge problem for dolphins because they are able to, to take the bait from the hook, yes, but uh, they are not so really common entangled in the or hooked on, on the hook bait of a long line, but long lines is a, a huge problem for sea turtles. And uh, I would say also injuries voluntarily made by fishermen with retaliation activities, such as the ones that I explained before. Um, uh, there, there is a typo there, but um, obviously sea turtles is a problem for fishermen, but not at the same level of dolphins. Dolphins for fishermen is an economic problem. Then it's a big problem. We made a survey again with fishermen at the beginning of the project, and they reported economic loss from two up to 10,000 euros a, a year. So you can imagine that, especially for us, most scale fishermen, this is a big problem. Uh, these are the two main species that we have in the Mediterranean. Here, the most common is the logaret, but if you go to the west, to the east Mediterranean, the green turtle is quite common, more common than the logaret. And the other are quite, quite rare. The ladderback, one specimen was caught two years ago here, uh, from uh, Catolica, but it's uh, absolutely uncommon. And to understand the bycatch, you have to know the species distribution, I told you before. This is more or less a general picture for sea turtles in the Mediterranean. You see in red what is called the, the benthic habitat for these species. That is where they go for uh, feeding. And if you consider in this area in red, uh, we have the large platform in the Mediterranean. So we are speaking about Adriatic Sea, the Gulf of, Gag of Gabi in Tunisia, Egypt, and uh, Turkey, East Turkey. In green, you have the pelagic habitat of the species, which is sometimes a, a black hole because you don't, we don't know exactly what happened, especially from the juvenile to the subadult uh, uh, of these species. We don't know exactly where they go, but for sure, uh, Adriatic is uh, an important feeding habitat. 
And then the problem that we have with these species is especially with uh, fishing gear used close to, close, close to the bottom, such as the bottom trolling, the passive nets, and uh, and also pelagic trolling because so we speak about pelagic trolling imaging in a net that is uh, on the sea surface but also pelagic trolling are used close to the bottom because especially during the day small pelagic uh, stay close to the bottom and they disperse during the night and that's why if you use bursain with lamps we have to use lamps to attract the fish from the surface. But OK, we have a big problem with uh, bottom trolling in a platform uh, such as the Adriatic. But in the green one, we have problem with uh, pelagic long lines because uh, we have different behavior of these species uh, in this area, different uh, distribution, and then <laughs> Different gears affect uh, the species in different way. In the uh, light blue uh, points, you have the most important uh, nesting sites. And in this area, the problem is with passive nets, especially when uh, you have hatchling leaving the nest uh, and uh, entangled on passive nets. Then if you use a really small meshes, in this area you probably catch all the all the small targets. Here you see what happened. Consider that usually passive nets are used for 12 hours. If the turtles is caught, the night before, stay underwater for 10 hours, 12 hours, then they cannot survive. That's why the direct mortality of this gear is much higher than with the bottom trolley, for instance. Sometimes they are caught on the rope or very close to the rope because Turtles, but also other organisms, are attracted by the floats that fishermen use to signal the nets. And uh, if the nets are used at uh, a small depth, they can reach the surface and to breathe. But if they are used at bottom, let's say more than 10 meters, uh, they cannot survive at all. Uh, Yes, that's what happens if you use passive nets close to the to the nesting site. Sometimes we found a specimen like this completely injured by by nets. This is a pelagic trolley, and you can see that at least in this type of gear, considering that the towing time is less than one hour. The specimen caught are usually alive when you retrieve the net. And uh, this is what happened in a bottom trolling. You can recognize the, the transparent water of the uh, Adriatic Sea. But if you see the, the turtle is still able to, to, seem, to swim within the net. Therefore, if you use some bycatch reducing devices, probably you are able to also to free these species. Uh, rapid trolling target species is the, the common soul. Again, uh, operating on the bottom, uh, you can have some problem also with the turtles. I found these from a fishing vessel uh, from Ancona, where the teeth of rapido trolling completely injured the, the turtle. If, if you see also here, 
So honestly, why don't I don't understand with the uh, uh, rapid trolling is the It has one single target species, which is the common soil, but uh, the same species is easily caught also by small scale fisheries with other with other fishing gears and less impacting fishing gear, such as passive nets. So probably this gear should be completely banned from the Adriatic because uh, we have an alternative because we have other gears catching this. Uh, this gear has a highly impact behavior on the bottom and on the bad communities. And third, uh, it's completely out of the gear classification because if you consider the gear classification made by the FAO, this is a dredge. This is not a, a, bottom, a bottom trolling, I mean. Uh, so. Uh. Yeah, sure, because uh, the quality of the soil caught by passive nets is. If you see also the, all the other species caught are completely full of sand or spoiled or. Whatever. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yes. But. In reason that Yes, in Croatia, they use exactly the same for scallops. That's why in Croatia, it's registered as dredge. Yes, also in the Italian side, but uh, so you know better than me the situation uh, from uh, Solomon survey. I don't know how many scallops remain in the North Adriatic. Uh, Probably there are small areas where you can find them, but. And then we went to the same as possible to seven years and like a unusual coincidence or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it happens sometimes. Uh, the same for oysters. Seems to be strange, but we have areas here in the Adriatic uh, where fishermen go to, to catch oysters. And they are trying to find a market for them. Obviously, the quality is not uh, like the oyster uh, that you farm. But again, it's a problem also for sea turtles. In a rapid. The small one, probably. But it was stuck in. Not yes, it cannot the enter the, the net. Easy to and you can also really start. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. The, the problem is that in some periods, uh, so we don't know exactly because we didn't publish these results. So the risk is to make some uh, assumption, but mm. the feeling is that uh, in some periods, uh, sea turtles aggregate for reproduction maybe, because sometimes we had a project on sea turtles lasting six years. Um, in some periods in bottom trolling, we found uh, even from eight up to 14 turtles in one hour. So probably they aggregate for some reasons, probably reproduction. And uh, yes, that's a problem because they stay exactly on the bottom. And if you use bottom gear, such as rapid trolling on bottom trolling, you can have a huge impact. Long line, you have drift, drifting on line and bottom long lines, 60 kilometers this gear and up to seven kilometers, if I remember well, for the bottom one. They are used like this, thousand of big hooks with a bait. And uh, the problem is that the bait, especially some types of bait, are extremely attractive for turtles and uh, 
they can completely ingest the hook with uh, almost lethal consequence. And there are several different parameters, technical parameters affecting the catch, <coughs> which is the hook size. In theory, larger hooks, larger specimen, which is in the theory of selectivity. Uh, the hook shape, because you can use J hooks or circle hooks, and we will see later. The type of bait is one of the most important factors because let's say if you use a squid, turtles are not so stupid. Uh, squid is more expensive, but is more attractive also for fish, for the tackle species, shark, uh, swordfish, and bluefin tuna. But squid also is more attractive also for turtles. Then one simple way to reduce bycatch is shifting from one type of bait to, to another. Depth setting. Another important factor, probably one of the main, is the depth of the main line, because uh, in the Mediterranean, one of the big problems that we have with uh, long lines is in the West Mediterranean, Spanish long liners. The estimates were uh, in the past up to 40,000 40, specimens caught each year, just in the West Mediterranean. Uh, in recent years, this number drastically reduced because fishermen shift the, the, the fishing practices from uh, surface long line to deeper long line. Then they avoid the first 50 meters of depth, reducing drastically uh, the bycatch of sharks, turtles, etc. The branch line length is another important factor affecting the, the direct mortality and also the delayed mortality because what happens when the fish retrieve the, the, the long line? If you have a hook at turtle, fisherman doesn't want to spend time and therefore to, to take directly the, the turtle on board, cut the branch line and free the, free the, gate, the turtle. They simply cut the, the branch line, and if the branch line is really long, in the long time, the, the turtle can ingest this branch line made of nylon and uh, with lethal consequence and delay the mortality. So these are the different parameters of the of the hook. J hook and circle hook. Now circle hook from let's say in the last 10 years has become one of the approach to reduce the delayed mortality. Because if you use J hook, turtle will ingest for sure reaching the esophagus or in the stomach with lethal consequences. If you use the, the circle hook, okay, this is the different types of bait, a squid and mackerel. Uh, if you use a circle hook, uh, turtles can bait the hook, but the hook remains usually on the mouth and you can feed the, the turtle without lethal consequences. Uh, for sharks, so sharks and rays, it's a mess, honestly, because uh, most of them are not protected. Some of them has a commercial value. So it's a really tricky matter to ask fishermen, uh, you, you have to feed this shark because uh, uh, it's a key species and uh, it's important for the ecosystem, etc. The, the fishermen can simply reply, but that's commercial species. And uh, so you can catch uh, shark, sharks and rays with uh, practically all the gears. And uh, these are the most common species, uh, I would say in the Adriatic Sea, the spinny dogfish, uh, there were in the past, especially in the North Adriatic Sea, specific fishery for that species. 
But again, uh, also right now, there are some periods where you can catch a huge amount of spinny dogfish uh, or chiliorinus, let's say. It's a shame, it's, it, even because if you have experience, experience with this species, when you reach this size, is too much. Then we are selling something which is really small and with a very limited commercial value. This species is quite important, also from a commercial point of view. If I, rem I remember that in the past when I did some training course for Coast Guard on inspections, this was one of the most uh, important species for uh, commercial fraud because they cut in slice and they sell these uh, as tuna or as uh, swordfish especially. There are some way to recognize the two type of fillets, but uh, if you are not an expert and you go to the market, you, you buy a good uh, slice of uh, swordfish eating sharks. The same is for rays. Quite common, the catch of this species, if you have experience with uh, rapid trolling or bottom trolling, they are quite common, especially Raya clavata and Raya Rayasteria. If you go more than 20 miles, or you also Raya nigaletus and all the other species. Some example, that's North Adriatic Sea or Central Adriatic. You, you can see that in some period, you can catch a lot of the species which are not protected and that has a market value. So you make a huge impact because we are, you are catching large specimens, reproductive specimens, etc., but they are marketable. And uh, yes, that's a shame, but uh, that's a real situation. Quite an uncommon species. I took these species from Malta, with, where we caught these species and also anglerfish, practically not present anymore here in the Adriatic, and quite rare also in, in the Mediterranean. This is what you explained before for sea turtles and quite common uh, to, to have large rays completely caught in, uh, <clears throat> in the teeth of the rapido trolling. Again, the long lines, if you see also for sharks, the circle hook remain just in the mouth and then you can theoretically to free the animal in a good shape. But you have problem also with bottom long line. I took this, uh, uh, if I remember when we were, uh, we were in Crotone, where you have a really big depth at uh, one mile from the coast, and where this type of fishing gear is uh, commonly used. And uh, not so rare to catch a big specimen like this that was uh, like this table, or more or less. Passive nets. We have an hot spot, you know very well, this, uh, Carmen, because this picture was taken exactly from that vessel. But here in the Adriatic, we have an hot spot for this, uh, and. Obviously, they have a market value, but again, a huge impact on this population. Another problem is the feeding. It is not a Mediterranean problem, to be honest, but it's a problem around the, all around the world because, uh, you know, the, the shark fins are commonly used in the Chinese uh, tradition, etc. And uh, now it's completely illegal in for the Eurimea Commission, but again, who knows uh, when you fish uh, 200 miles from the coast. 
Ok, not finish, but I have another. Um, this is just to give you a general overview. Uh, I put bycatch estimates, but to be honest, by needing this document, this was the state of fishery document in the, made by the FAOGFCM for the Mediterranean. To be honest, in my opinion, these are not estimates. They are just a way to show where we have a problem. Because uh, they are collecting data from different types of sources. I mean, there are data from monitoring, data from strandings, they come from uh, personal observations, etc. So these numbers should be completely not considered in my opinion. Even before, even because after this document, uh, two years later, the GFCM produced uh, another document specific for the bycatch. This was about uh, all the, the, the different sources, also commercial for the Mediterranean. The other was specific for the bycatch. And the pictures, the picture is a bit different. But again, you can see the, the, the different uh, impact in the Mediterranean from different fishing gears. You can see for, okay, that bottom trolling has a huge impact on sea turtles, as I explained before. Long line, uh, especially on sea turtles, but also on sharks. Pelagic trawler, again, sea turtles, but sharks, lasma branch in general. The same for Pursain where you can have, uh, not here in, in the Adriatic or in Italy, but in other parts of the Mediterranean, especially North Africa countries, they have a problem with sharks in the poor same fisheries. And the small scaling, again, turtles, and the tuna sailors, again, the Lasmo branch. Here you can see the problem in different areas of the Mediterranean, sub-regions, what is called sub-regions in the Mediterranean. In the West, you have a big problem with the long lines. In the Adriatic, you have a problem with bottom trolling. In the Central, you have a problem with everything. If you consider some data from Tunisia, it is impressive for the bycatch of turtles, sharks, uh, everything. In the Eastern, you have a problem, especially with uh, bottom of line and small scale fisheries and the Black Sea. Practically, you have problem just with uh, small scale fisheries. And uh, so dealing with uh, the, the document that we have uh, produced for the GFCM on bycatch, Black Sea is a mess because, uh, because of the problem of our purpose. But even because, uh, especially considering the present situation, it is practically impossible to have reliable data, especially from some countries, you can imagine. And um, yes, for Russia, we had zero data. And uh, for marine mammals, you have problems, especially in the Western Mediterranean and Eastern, and especially in Black Sea, here uh, they report 9,000 specimen codes, but the situation is even worse than this. Uh, and you can see here for the Black Sea, the problem is practically just with the small scale fisheries. And in the Adriatic, we have problem with the pelagic trolling, if you see, is, but and that's why it is mandatory to monitor, to monitor this this fishery. But again, uh, the real situation is that something like we would say less than ten specimen 
each year are caught in this basin. But again, we have to consider that for this type of species with uh, this case species, even 10 specimens each year can be a huge impact on the on the entire population. There are some analysis to assess these, the PBIR, and uh, which is quite uh, uh, common right now to make. And uh, but we have to know the status of the population, the biological parameters of these species, and and to have a, 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 the estimate of bycatch. By putting all these together, you can get information if uh, what you are catching, yeah, what, what you're catching is sustainable or not. Okay, uh, here we have uh, uh, again by catch with the Focena in the Black Sea and the other species for the the rest of the Mediterranean. The two species are the strap, the Istanella and the and the common bottlenose dolphin. So for the bulk seal, practically you have problem just in the GNC where we have a, a population of these species and the most impacting here are passiveness, obviously. Uh, in the rest of the Mediterranean, we have just sightings, so we cannot speak about the problems with the uh, uh, fish, I mean. Yes, I don't want to spend so much time on this because, you know, the problem is uh, focused on uh, on the Aegean Sea with the passive nets and the same uh, uh, for pelagic trolling, where the main problem is exactly here in the Adriatic. I reported some estimates, but they are just number. I mean, it doesn't matter. Uh, for arbor purpose, the main problem is in the Black Sea for uh, passive nets or trammel nets used for, to catch the turbot. Scoptalmus, uh, I don't remember the species, Meoticus, which is similar to the, the Scoptalmus maximus that we have here in the, in the Adriatic. But the estimates are impressive, I, I mean. And um, I want to jump all this. Long lines is not a big, really a big problem for marine mammals, but it's a problem for sharks and rays. Here again, there is a general, very general situation. I reported some data on how many species, uh, but again. These are all the species that are all the species that are uh, formally protected under uh, this recommendation. Recommendations are mandatory for uh, the the member part, the, the country partners of the GFCM. But again, uh, sometimes there is not a formal act regulation or a decree. <clears throat> this is the status of landings, etc. But um, I want to focus on another part of this presentation. This is the picture about sharks and rays, etc. But again, I don't want to lose time on this. For sea turtles, uh, we reported these estimates just to give an idea of the numbers. In the, in the Adriatic, look at the Adriatic Sea, at the Adriatic Sea, bottom trolling each year. We have something like 18,000 capture events that are not uh, about the turtles' death, that is around 3,000. But again, these are estimates based on papers, based on uh, other information. This is the situation in the 
Mediterranean, but again, I don't want to lose time on this. And uh, according to the data reported here, we made a kind of uh, very preliminary risk assessment for this, the different species in different areas according to the different gear used. When you see red, we, we, this approach usually uh, you have to establish a kind of rank and to assign uh, a value for each type of uh, relation. And when you see red, the situation is not it's not good. I mean, and uh, yes, according to the different fishing gears, you can see the the different risk of impact. And uh, okay, that that is just a way to apply the risk assessment to the the situation. Um, but we can do uh, something on fishing gears to reduce the bycatch or dedicate the more targeting. Um, all this part uh, is about how to introduce new technologies in a fishery, because as you can imagine, it is not an easy task because fishermen are put on traditions and uh, they usually don't want to change, obviously, their gear, their practices, etc. And uh, but the, the, the most effective way to introduce a new technology in a fishery is through a bottom-up bottom up approach, I mean. You have to involve fishermen since the beginning to, to reach uh, solutions together, I mean. Because if the, the solution is a top-down imposition from the EU Commission or from the uh, national authorities, you don't have, you, you will not have any positive results. It's the same for any different type of technical measures that we try to apply for the Mediterranean. Uh, but before introducing new a new technology, you have to know very well which problem you want to solve, which are the characteristics of this uh, fishery. You have to make uh, several different trials with different solutions up to reaching the the, the final configuration of the gear modification. Um, but before introducing a new, a new technology, you have to be aware of the environmental um, consequences of using uh, a new technology. Uh, if there is an economic benefit, obviously, you have to propose to, to fishermen something which is uh, economic affordable for fishermen that uh, doesn't change too much their uh, fishing behavior or their uh, procedure on boards. Uh, and especially the new solutions that you want to introduce to reduce the bycatch should not affect the commercial catch because uh, obviously if you introduce something which is effective for reducing bycatch of tartars but that reduce the catch of 50%, obviously this, this solution should not be accepted at all by fishermen. Um, therefore, when you, cons when you want to introduce a new solution to a fishery, you have to consider the practical problem, which is basically how to fix a this new solution to the gear, the specific gear or to the specific vessel. You have to consider the, the short-term loss because when you speak with fishermen, you, you, you can speak uh, 10 years about the long-term positive effect of this solution, but the fishermen just understand the, 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 the short-term economic loss. And um, yes. Okay. This is what I explained before, practically see, acceptable for fishermen, so economically viable, and also acceptable for management. So consider, for example, that now I had a case in last year. Uh, so if you want to sell 
to the United States shrimps caught with uh, bottom trolling, you have to mount uh, on board sorting grids. It is mandatory if you want to export your product to the United States. And last year we had a problem with uh, some fishing vessel from Mazzaro del Vallo. They wanted to sell shrimp, red shrimp, to the United States, but the United States request this vessel to have on board sorting grids for turtles. But you know, the red shrimp is caught at 700 meters of depth. Therefore, the, the problem is absolutely not uh, a problem of marine turtles that you can find up to maximum 100 meters of depth. Then one solution could be to be obliged to use this, uh, this solution, which is not, in my opinion, the most uh, effective approach. This is the grid uh, I was speaking uh, about the turtle extruder devices that are simply grids put just before the codon to avoid the catch of large specimens such as sea turtles and sharks. We are using these in a couple of projects. Uh, this one that was start alive, another one which is in progress, which is alive about a reduction of anatomy branches catch. The theory is quite simple. Using a grid that allow the commercial speech to the commercial species to reach the codon and the last specimen to be ejected from the from the net obviously this is simple by speaking but not an easy task to apply because there are several different technical parameters to arrange and uh, yes just to give an overview these are the parameters that we took into account before trying this type of grids, the, the angle of the grids, you increase, if you increase too much, you lose the catch of a commercial issue. There are several different matters to consider. The space between the bars, um, the material, because you can have hard grids or flexible grids. If you use the one can be more effective. If you, if you use the flexible one, Fisherman could be more happy because it's easy to handle on board. So there are several different stuff to consider. That were the, the first experiment that we did in 2007, probably. That is mainly because uh, the catch of turtle is uncommon. So we tried to make some uh, funny experiment with uh, something like stupid things like this, but this will enable to us to, to see if uh, the solution that we wanted to introduce were effective or not. At the beginning, they were not effective because we had problem with materials, with the shape, uh, and step by step, we developed this type of grids until uh, the, the, the last models that were more effective until the one, which is this one, which is the flexible grids, uh, really effective. Uh, we tried this in the all around the, the all the central and northern Adriatic Sea to demonstrate that they are they do not imply any major commercial loss. Um, Yes, this is what we did in, in several projects and several trials, etc. <clears throat> and this is what we did to demonstrate that there were not economic loss. At the end of the hole, if you see, the speed of vessel reduce and the, the fish inside the net change direction and reach the, the code. Here in the upper part, the net was completely open. And if you see the fish simply pass through the bars of the grid and reach the codon without any commercial loss, I mean. And the same was uh, with uh, an hard grid where the fish uh, can simply swim and reach the codon. If you see, if you hear the sound, you can feel the presence of dolphins. 
because they are following the, the, the button trolling here. And it's the same from the beginning up to the end of the hole. And yes, there are several different uh, technical parameters that you have to consider. Uh, how to fix uh, the grid, in which direction, uh, upper escape opening, lower escape, escape opening, the angle of the grids. So uh, easy to discuss, but not easy to apply, I mean. <laughs> and to demonstrate that uh, there are not economic losses, you have to, to publish papers and to demonstrate that, that there are not economic losses. Otherwise, if you don't if you don't have a scientific support of your uh, statement, you don't have any uh, trust. Credibility, I mean. Yes, we demonstrated that there were not uh, any commercial loss or any, even any um, influence on the size of the of the fish coat. Okay, I, I didn't remember uh, so many slides on this. And we also uh, provide insight on the different. Uh, in the fish quality. So by using our flex grid, this was a, uh, a twin troll, two nets towed by the same vessel. On the left, we had the grid. On the, on the right uh, is our control, the traditional grid, the, the traditional net. And you can see that also from uh, the quality of fish that we caught, the quality was completely different. Here, completely dirt, uh, dirt catch, uh, and here a completely clean catch. And also uh, a reduction of the, the litter can be an option. But now the, the, there is a different approach with the litter. You don't, we don't want to, de to delete uh, litter, but, but we, we want to catch litter to clean the sea. So probably this is not a, the right solution. OK, and uh, the other solutions can be. It is quite famous now around the world is the use of lights to deter. Different type of different type of bycatch, such as in the case. Uh, sea turtles, in this case, uh, the lights were effective 100%. I mean, using. Uh, lights on night trammel nets and gill nets, we had a reduction of 100% of uh, sea turtles bycatch. The problem on the other side is that uh, it is not uh, it is not the solutions that uh, we can propose right now to fishermen because you have to attach the lamps one by one, you have to recharge the battery, so there are technical problems of using these uh, these bycatch reducing devices but probably the the path is in, in the right direction but we have to find out different solutions so not all uh, not all the solutions are uh, directly useful i mean but that's why what I say often is that uh, it's useful to publish also negative results of your uh, research, because uh, if you don't publish that, OK, these lamps are effective, but uh, they are not absolutely useful right now for commercial purpose. Uh, other scientists can make uh, your exactly exactly your uh, your mistake, losing time, you losing resources, etc. So it is, in my opinion, it's extremely useful to publish also negative results of uh, research. Here we also demonstrated that there were not uh, any significant difference in the commercial cash. Another option is to use alternative fishing gears such as, in this case, collapsible pots, 
we use this type of pots because when you close the pots, it's a foldable pots. And the problem with the small scale fishery, small scale fisheries, is the space on board. You cannot charge 100 pots because you don't have space. If you use pots like this, you save space because you can fold completely the, the pots and you can use hundreds of pots in this case. If you see this video is how it works. When the pot is open, is is that big, but uh, you can completely close the like this the pots. Using alternative gear can can be an approach. Obviously, not everywhere you have to to propose this in a dock uh, area and fishery, even because not all the fish for their habits enter the pots. There are specimens like such as shrimp that, that they don't like pots, at least some pinnate species. Some pots are used for uh, lesionica, let's say in the south of Italy, but not for pinnates. So you have to calibrate these, uh, but using alternative gears can be an approach to reduce the bycatch. Because obviously a pot is less impacting than uh, a fish at nets, I mean. And you can also catch very big specimen like these dentex. The same for circo for hooks. I just described that moving from uh, J hooks to circle hooks, you you can reduce the delayed mortality at at, at least for certain species such as such as uh, sea turtles and sharks. Using uh, deepest long line, that was uh, a prize for uh, WWF Smart Fish and the fishery for um, I don't remember where won this prize because using they demonstrated that using deeper long lines reduced the bycatch of sensible species, vulnerable species. The same reducing time setting. Obviously, this is not always applicable because uh, if you use 60 kilometers of long line, you spend something like 12 hours to set and to retrieve the long line. So there are some time, some cases where, where you cannot reduce the, the soaking time. For instance, the, the problem of bycatch in the Black Sea with Arbor Purpose is mainly because they use Passing nets with a soaking time of about two or three weeks. That's why I probably they have a problem with arbor purpose because they use large large meshes for to catching turbot, the big turbot, and they also have a soaking time over two or three weeks. The bycatch in this way is practically unavoidable. We are trying some solution, but. I, I did the same, exactly the same question, but they they told me the the toolbots stay alive, and uh, but they they control the fishing gear every two or three weeks. I simply say that that's why we have a bike. <laughs> yeah. Uh, to face and deploying, and the albatross is actually greatly endangered because of that in the southern ocean. Yeah, yeah. Yes, seabirds is here in the Mediterranean is a problem specific for the West Mediterranean. But just to come back to the uh, bias in monitoring, false positive and false negative, that could be mainly because. In the West Mediterranean, Mediterranean, we have a strong monitoring of sea of seabird bycatch, but in the rest of the Mediterranean, we don't have any monitoring on that. And who knows if uh, the problem of bycatch is in the West just because they have some more monitoring. 
So another option I told you before is to shift from different types of bait or different position of bait, such as this uh, mackerel. How to avoid the seabird bycatch? This is a quite easy and famous solution. Is using streamer lines to avoid the interaction of birds in the first few meters behind the behind the vessel because they, because the interact their interactions with the hook between seabirds and hook and hooks of a long line is just in the few meters behind the, the fishing vessels. And so you have to avoid these interactions in the few meters, 10 meters, uh, <clears throat> just be behind the, the, the fishing vessels. The other way is to shoot the, the main line directly underwater. Uh, that is what we are trying to do to, to avoid this kind of bycatch. For sharks, uh, one of the solutions could be using sharks with uh, using using hooks with uh, magnets. The problem is the high cost because you have to modify each single hook by joining the use of uh, a magnet that is uh, detectable by from sharks. I mean, this reduce probably the catch. But uh, there is a problem with the cost. With passive nets, a way to reducing the at least the shark bycatch is to raise the food drop from the bottom, such as in this way. There are way there are some way the which is called the, the Greca approach to raise the the food drop from the bottom. You leave a space from really benthic specimen to uh, to pass below the net. Obviously, you can use this if your target species is not common sort. OK, this is a, a quite short video from this project that we are carried out. It's still ongoing. And it is just to provide you an, an approach to, to, the pro, to a project, but we will speak a little bit more later. You have a problem, which is the strandings of more than 200 species each year. More of them, most of them are bottlenose. There is an interaction, especially with the small scale fisheries. We have a problem with the interaction, which is mostly depredation of dolphins from the net. Depredation is Depredation is when a dolphin directly steal fish from the net. As I saw a paper two months ago, a really recent paper, uh, where the authors claim that this is not the right word to use because they do not uh, depredate fish. They are simply eat their own fish. We are the the we are depredating the, the, the fish from the sea. <clears throat> but this is also a good example that everything is publishable, in my opinion. They published this paper in uh, ISIS Journal of Marine Science, which is uh, a good journal. And it's about the word depredation. They made a, a complete review of all the uh, translation of depredation, etc., 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 and they demonstrate that you cannot use this uh, for uh, for dolphins. Uh, I collaborate uh, last last month to the production of the regional plan of action for the Mediterranean bycatch with the, the GFCM, and he had to insert a sentence that. OK, we refer to bite to depredation word, but consider that depredation maybe it is not the right. The right word because it, it can uh, stimulate the, the, the sensibility of some uh, people, I mean. Yes, th th this was simply a video. That we did at the beginning of the project uh, to demonstrate the problem. 
that was the dolphin that we caught in uh, pair trolling. But we have problems with these with dolphins all around the Mediterranean, the Adriatic Sea, and the the all around the Mediterranean Sea. And these are the commercial loss that we found. That that uh, went to the to a, a social problem in some areas where fishermen went on strikes a couple of years ago, three years ago. And these projects also has uh, a huge uh, awareness activity. And uh, these are some solutions that we tried in this project. The pingers. With pingers, we have really a big problem because they are used to emit sound uh, to scare fish, to scare dolphins from the net. <clears throat> the problem is that uh, in the long time, a sound can be recognized by dolphins and uh, the, 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 the effort is known as the lunch bell because at the beginning, the dolphins are scared about do the, the, this finger, but in the long period, they they are accustomed to the sound and they associate the, the sound of finger to the presence of, uh, of nets and then to the presence of food. The problem is that mm, there are some uh, factory producing this type of interactive pingers that in theory inter um, switch on just uh, in presence of dolphins. This is what is uh, in the in the fact in the um, in the website of the factory. This is a finger interactive activating in with just with the presence of dolphins. The real situation is that uh, when you put this device in the water, is always on, and then uh, that's why you have a. Uh, uh, the lunch or dinner, uh, the effect of these of these devices. That's why we are working to modify these in a more interactive uh, pinger using artificial intelligence. Okay, I don't remember where we were. Okay, but. Yes, this is also for you. We have an app now in local econo ecological knowledge. Uh, the use of app uh, has become really common using smartphone app to make uh, sightings or to make uh, to register the catch, etc. Uh, yes, we are using this and you are trying to develop a new type of pingers, more interactive and based on uh, artificial intelligence recognition. Uh, this is the problem. In the past, we tried the different types of pinger. They were effective, but uh, we didn't find any statistical significance different between and without uh, the use of pinger. So uh, they seem to be effective, but we didn't have at, at that time, at least we didn't have any statistical uh, uh, demonstration of this. Uh, this is a quite new approach using acrylic pearls mounted on on the net this is why this is because uh, arbor purpose can easily recognize the presence the presence of the net with uh, their acoustic uh, uh, system etc the, the sonar uh, that they have using this small acrylic peers seems to be effective this is a uh, an experiment be made by the Tune and colleague from uh, 
uh, Germany. The problem is that uh, they have to find out a factory producing and attaching one by one these peers on the on the net. Probably they, they are trying to solve this. The use of pot, this is the problem of storage on board that I explained before. If you want to use several pods, you have to, to have space on board. And there are different types of pot of collapsible pot. This is an example of deterrent device that you can use in poor sale. Obviously, not easy to use, absolutely not. Because you have to use this type of grid and, and also this backing now, backing down mano uh, operation to avoid the catch of dolphins. And uh, so this is basically what I wanted to to describe. But <clears throat> yesterday I spent the day on on a train. And uh, mm, so I put myself in your, uh, in you. I mean, I remember when uh, when I I was uh, a PhD student. I had to follow lessons on uh, phytoplankton, foraminifera, uh, chemical that were mostly the same lessons that I had uh, during the master degree. And, uh, and probably, <clears throat> I don't know, so I consider you right now as colleague, probably young colleague, but what I see from, from you and for your colleagues, what you probably miss is uh, to make a project from from the zero, I mean, because probably you apply to the, this PhD because you are charged on a project or because someone uh, found foundings to pay your PhD or. Uh, so the problem is to. Is to have a prop to have a project and. Um, So listen, this is not a, a complete lesson on uh, how to, to build a project because uh, uh, it's a completely different story. You have to, to, to understand what is uh, a project flow, a logical framework. Uh, there are some specific training course for this. But yesterday when I was in, on a train, uh, I, was speak, I was thinking about what can be useful uh, for you. I mean, and... Uh, so by considering all I described until now, I just want to be aware of what is at least my approach in making a project. A project. Uh, so now I'm working, coordinating a proposal for a, a, an horizon project on bycatch. To make a project, you have to consider several different issues. So first of all, you should have an idea. And possibly a winning idea. I mean, uh, you have to think on the future. Uh, I remember, mm, let's say 15 years ago, uh, I was thinking about what can be a, a winning idea for a project or for a uh, for, for addressing my research activity. <clears throat> At that time, the idea for me was Marie Litter. Marie Litter is okay. I think Marie Litter could be an option. Uh, that was bec mainly because when I worked on board uh, bottom trolling, half percent of the catch was about uh, nets from aquaculture 15 years ago, more than 15 years ago. But at that time, I proposed this to my director, and my director says, no, this is not a good idea. Work on fishing technology. I work on fishing technology, and I was happy with that. But uh, after 15 years, I would say probably 
marine litter would be a better field of activity to, to, to find projects in the in the next 15 years, I mean. So in my opinion, you should think right now, what could be the future of, of, of research? Modeling, probably modeling could be focusing on modeling. But in my opinion, you should think right now, what could be the future of this of research and uh, uh, what research is, is going, I mean. And, uh, but again, now I'm working with uh, uh, protected species. I'm happy with this. I receive tons of uh, proposals from students. I want to work with dolphins. I like dolphins. Uh, I like turtles, but the, I'm sorry for that. But the the, the first the first answer that I, I usually do to these students is okay. If you want if you want to work with dolphins, uh, you don't have to come here. You have to, you have to find out a, a different way. Because yes. Passion is the first step that you have to follow, but the second is money. There was a, a project I remember, a, a, a movie I remember that uh, if you want to find, uh, I don't remember what, you have to follow the money. Uh, the, the same uh, is for research. I mean, you have to invest in research where probably there would be money. Fishing activity is one of these sectors, because uh, if you can consider that one of the main program that we have as a CNR is on data collection on fishery. This is a way that we have money from the next uh, 100 years, probably. What I want to say is that you don't, you don't have to Avoid considering your passion, but be practical and think about uh, where the research uh, is uh, going on and uh, where can be my future. And then, so for the project, you have you should have a, a good idea, but uh, you have to find out the the right call. I mean. You have to check which calls are going on in the, I'm just speaking on the EU project, but there are several different ways to, to find the, to find ba the budget and money. Your question should be, does my idea fit well on where, where the call is asking? I mean, uh, now I'm applying for, um, research project on bycatch reduction, but the call is quite simple, is on bycatch reduction. But it's not always like uh, straight, I mean. And, uh, but if you want to make a, prob a project, you have, you have to have a problem to solve. I mean, my question was, uh, yes, I want to make a project on uh, protect the species, but my problem is what are the estimates of bycatch? Or at least uh, try to have uh, uh, bycatch rates for gear and species. This is the most important thing that we miss until now, because, okay, fishing effort right now for the, at least for the EU countries, cannot be a, a major problem because we have enough data, but the problem is to have reliable bycatch data. I cannot, I cannot say this also for other countries that we have in the project, such as the North Africa countries. I remember that in the past, I did the training for, uh, let's say, Coast Guard inspectors in uh, Egypt, in uh, Palestine, in Lebanon, and uh, when I was there, the, the, the first thing that they told me is, no, but we don't have any kind of illegal fishing here because uh, we are strict. Uh, there are there are uh, several fee 
uh, fines if you make something wrong, etc. And at the first day where, where we went directly on the arbor, I saw everything. Boat sail used between the vessels, uh, uh, passive nets used uh, in the arbor, etc. So I believe that also the the data on fishing effort can be a problem there. Um, the other problems that I ask that I think about is the survivability and the delayed mortality. Exactly, we don't know how what the, the delayed mortality is for several species. And then uh, we have to think about technologies to study this that can be simply using satellite tags on sharks, let's say, to see what happened to the shark that you free after the catch. And the third problem is to develop a bycatch reducing devices because I showed you before several different uh, approaches and technical solutions, but the problem is to apply in the in the real life. I mean, it's easy to say, OK, we are using uh, turtle excluder devices. I, I gave a support for to projects I don't want to say, but WWF and other NGOs involved in, they simply, OK, we did a project on turtle excluder device without knowing anything about. Uh, and uh, they took this device made by who knows, put on the vessel. And the first quest question for me was, but we are losing all the catch. Yes, you are losing all the catch because you are not using it in the right way. So there are several different technical pa parameters and considerations that you have to take into account. Um, second, you have to consider what are your needs. In the case of bycatch species, the most important issue is to improve monitoring, which is we need to improve mo the, the surveys. We have to improve the, the technologies that, that, that we are that we use, uh, such as the remote electronic monitoring, but also the PIM is the passive acoustic. Passive acoustic for monitoring the presence of dolphins is still used on uh, research projects, but not used for monitoring purpose until now. That could be an approach, in my opinion. The other needs that we have. Uh, is to identify the hotspot areas for bycatch. I mean, we cannot imagine to monitor all the Mediterranean with onboard server, all everywhere with uh, the same level of monitoring, etc. Uh, we have to be practical and to consider that we have problem with budget for this. Then probably we have to focus the attention where we really have a problem. That's why we have to apply a risk assessment to identify hotspot for bycatch, for gear, metier, etc. And the final need is to, develop, is to develop the effective BRDs. So when you build the project, then you have to, to find out the, the, the right call for you. But reading the, the call, you have, you have to be careful on the date of publication. You have to be always on searching for uh, the right call, but sometimes it happens that, oh, I miss this call that close, the deadline is tomorrow. Then you have to be aware of the date of publication, deadline, etc. Which kind of program? There are several different programs. I put here the most famous for uh, fishery sector, life programs. Life is not really mm, new, but it's a quite new program for fishing. I work on that uh, in the last 10 years, more or less. But before, life projects were mostly applied to problems that we have with uh, wolf, seabirds, so on land uh, problems. You have to be aware of the objective of the calls. You cannot simply say, I want to make a project on this call. You have to respect what the call exactly ask for. You have to be aware of the duration of the project. This is not, this is not an easy 
task to, to, to think about because sometimes to, to solve a problem that you have, you have, to, you have to apply for a project of four or five years. And uh, involving a consortium in a four or five year project, it's, uh, it, it's not an easy task because after two or three years, you lose interest from a project and you lose interest from your partners. So you have to be very careful on how long you want to, to make your project ease. You have to be careful of the financial, how much your project is financed, what, you, what is the, the maximum your contribution. Really, really important is the co-financial, the percentage of financing from this specific program. I mean, sometimes I see, oh yes, apply, yeah, I apply for this project, which is two million project. But uh, you consider the percentage of co-financing, and sometimes I receive the answer, what is this co-financing that I, I didn't consider? The co-financing is, uh, how much you as uh, institution can contribute to the project. I mean, if you apply with a project that has 1 million of, expensi of, of expenses, sometimes, really often, the program doesn't cover all these expenses, but uh, let's say the program finance can finance the, the 70% or 60% or 50% of your expenses. And yet you can cover the other 50% by your own fundings that usually are personal costs. But you have to consider this because you have to be able to, to make a piece of papers of your personal costs, etc. Is it not? This is not always an easy task. You have also to consider how many projects can be financed by, by this call, because for sure you will have several competitors and you have to be keen on where, which, which type of call can have uh, less competitors. Then you have to think about this. And what are the selection criteria? This is another key point. You have to demonstrate the ability of your consortium. So you cannot make uh, for really uh, interdisciplinary project. You cannot uh, involve just a research partner, but you have to involve also stakeholders and different. You have to, to have different skills on board, uh, on board your project to cover different uh, disciplines because this is one of the selection criteria. The other is about the, the curriculum of the experts, etc. But uh, And when you build a, a budget, you have to consider three different points of view. If you were the EU commissions and you think about the budget, you think, okay, the budget, should reach our target. Then we set a specific call in this project, in this program to reach our European Commission target. But there are general rules within uh, the European Commission and this call and this program respect this rule for the budget. From the European Commission, when you see a proposal, you have to assess if uh, the beneficiaries has the right capability to make this type of project. This is one of the selection criteria that I spoke before. All your expenses should respect the best value for money approach. That is what we reach with uh, internal rules, uh, with the, the three 
uh, invoices that we request from the different factories, etc. when we want to buy every single bottle of waters. Uh, <clears throat> at the beginning of the project, the EU Commission signed uh, signs a, a grant agreement with uh, the winner, the beneficiary that the won the, the project. And uh, when uh, the European Commission assess the expenses, they want to, to check if every single expenses is in line or with the, the grant agreement. Now, in most of projects, you cannot say, I want to spend uh, 100,000 euros for this PC and after after the project uh, in real in the real uh, when you are really working on the project mm, I don't want to spend 100,000 euros for this I want to spend 50,000 euro in this bottle sometimes there are some limits uh, that you you cannot uh, overcome you have to be then when you write a project you have to be quite sure about uh, the different types of expenses that you want to, to make during the project. You have to be quite strict because you have sometimes no more than 10% of a uh, of way to, 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 to jump from the what you said uh, before in the in the proposal. And most important, you are monitored since the beginning and periodically all along the project, and you will have a monitoring at the end of, uh, at the, end of the project. If you are the person writing the project, if you are the project manager, when you apply for a project, we have to think, first of all, it's convenient. You have to think about a project quite uh, or a budget quite detailed, but a little bit flexible because, as I explained before, sometimes when you write a project, you are pretty sure of what you are going to do, but sometimes there are problems and you have to to change direction in your project, and then you have to think about a certain flexibility. On, on the budget that, that you are setting. The third point is that, OK, what are, I'm proposing in this call is in line with the, the rules of my institution, because you have to consider of the administrative and financial constraint that we have as public uh, research, I mean. People working with me, uh, knows very well the problems that we have in the CNR for buying everything or make uh, travels, etc. But it's the same everywhere. I mean, so when you apply for a budget, think also about the constraint that you can have as uh, in your administration. The last point is also if uh, your budget is administrative manageable. I mean, at the end of the project, you will have you will have a, a mountain of documents relating to your project. Is your administration able to manage this amount of work? Think about this before setting a project. Sometimes, and this is uh, at least my approach and the approach that sometimes is quite common is to make external assistance to support you in this part of the project. Otherwise, you are scientists and you don't want to lose so much time in administrative stuff. And uh, believe me, it's a huge problem when you don't have a, a stronger administrative competence and support. Uh, the last point of view is the auditor, the third, the company, the external company that monitor your expenses, your budget. The first quest question is, was everything spent? If you have a project with a budget of 1 million, the first check that they 
the first thing that they control is everything was, was spent. They spent one million. OK. So in theory. It is reasonable in all the projects where you have an audit to make. Uh, I, to be honest, I, I wouldn't say this, but it's a real situation. Uh, you have to. To have a, a little bit of um, overspending. I mean, because for sure some expenses will be not recognized from the auditor because you made a mistake, because you didn't respect the rule uh, of the program, uh, because you don't have uh, three invoices. Uh, so something can be deleted from, from the auditor and deleted from the final financing that you are asking for from the European Commission. So a good uh, advice is in all projects to provide uh, an overspending. The auditor also check if all the expenses that you have respect the grant agreement that you signed that you signed at the beginning with the European Commission, and if uh, all single expenses uh, respect the general rules of the program. The, each program sells the general rules uh, and about the external assistance, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. We have to respect. Uh, the the guidelines that they provide uh, for each program. When you set a budget, you should be clear, realistic, transparent, and comprehensible. I mean, you cannot put uh, their expenses that are not clear enough or. I mean, you should be keen when you set uh, your budget. And uh, because uh, you have to think about all the documents that, that, that we have to produce after the proposal. I mean, in the proposal, you can promise uh, everything. The real problem is when you work to the project and you, you have more the practical problems. All the costs that you set in the budget must be eligible. I mean, there are some programs that, uh, let's say, do not allow to make some types of expenses. Let's say external assistance. There are projects that, uh, I don't have an example now, but uh, where you cannot make, uh, uh, you cannot consider external assistance over a certain threshold. So think about if your budget is eligible or not. Consider the co-financing. This is the crucial point because you have to cover part of the expenses of the project with your own budget. All the expenses must be done during the duration of the project. There are some strange projects where you can put in your financial statement also expenses done before the beginning of the project. Let's say six months before the beginning of the project that are considered like uh, expenses for the preparation of the project. But not so not so common. You have to make expenses according to the grant agreement that you sign with the European Commission. And you have to support every single expenses with document. Just to give you an example, if you make uh, a travel or a meeting for just one single travel, you have to support this with uh, uh, the order of mission, uh, invoice of uh, hotel or invoice of lunch. You have to provide a document that your administration produce for the payment. You have to provide the bank document providing that the institution has regularly paid this mission to you. So at least four types of document. Um, there are different types of costs. The direct costs are all the costs that are directly 
assigned to the project and supported by document. The personnel, all the equipment or which is called the durable goods, which is a little different from consumables. APC is a durable goods. Uh, a fishing net is a consumable because you can lose during your tests or your, your, your project. Then you have services or external assistance. You have to provide invoices, at least three invoices, before uh, assign a service to that specific company. After this, they have to produce all the invoice. Uh, you have to demonstrate that you paid this uh, company, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So you have to demonstrate all this with documents. Other direct costs are travels, and finally, what is called other costs, such as renting boats, uh, which something which is not directly uh, linked to the consumable equipment, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Sometimes this uh, is covered by external assistance, but there are something. Sometimes there are other costs for these costs, which are not uh, well defined in the previous uh, categories. The indirect costs are what is called general costs or sometimes overheads. These are costs that are not directly assigned to the project, but that are useful for uh, the activity of a beneficiary. Let's say, such as sometimes is. Uh, the expenses for energy, for uh, water, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. These are overhead, and sometimes they should be supported by documents. But in most of cases, you don't have to provide any document to support the overheads. That is the part of flexibility that you, that you can consider for your projects. And uh, and usually the overheads are set by the program, not by you. In a, a threshold. That usually changes according to the different programs that can be 25 or 20 percent of the program. Sometimes it's a 20 that is the 10 percent of the total direct cost. But that's a threshold of budget that you consider quite uh, free. Direct cost plus indirect cost are your eligible costs. Um, when you are starting building your budget, you have to, to think about uh, some simple or but basic consideration, which is the total financing financing of the call. What's the percentage of? Of the of this financing, the, what's the total contribution? Obvious, obviously, if you find coal where one hundred percent of the expenses are eligible, is better than uh, to consider project with uh, co-financing. Um, you have to consider if your institution has the internal resources in terms of administration, in terms of technicians or in terms to afford these expenses and this project. And also if you have which kind of external service or skills you need for your project. The second question that you have to ask is if is your project project appealing? In term, uh, so I want to make a project, but uh, it's appealing for the scientific community. Is appealing for the EU, EU Commission. Is in line also with the program. Uh, it enhances. Is this project enhancing the, the the knowledge? Is feasible? Because sometimes we promise something that we cannot reach. Uh, is the project sustainable? I mean, uh, sometimes we think about projects where the, the, 
the limit of expenses is too high for the for the the competencies or for the avail the personnel available in your institution. So finally, are we able to make this project? We have enough experience, we have enough, enough personnel devices such as boats or uh, we need this specific uh, device on instrumentation to make this type of uh, analysis, etc. We have to consider all these. And you have to, to, to follow the guideline for applicants for all this. When you start making an application, you have you will have an application form that usually is divided in three main sections. The one is about the administrative section where you have to insert all the administrative information of all the consortium partners is for public, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, administrative stuff. The other section is the technical one where you have to write in detail what you are going to do in your project, which uh, analysis, uh, how many holes, how many days, uh, which technology, etc. And the final is the financial section where you have to put generally in tables, your budget, the expenses for the personnel, external assistance, uh, divided in, let's say, the different work packages that you set in your project, tasks, etc. It's uh, about tables with your budget. Uh, there are several other stuff from this, but this is just to provide you an overview of the problems that you face just the beginning when you try to to start a project or to build a, a proposal. So I don't know if everything was useless, but uh, that's all for my side. I hope uh, that you get a little bit something useful. That's all. <laughs>